Welcome to the CMC Markets webinar with me, market analyst David Madden. The time is 12.15. The date uh, is the 14th of August. Um, and just before we kick off the webinar, as we always do, uh, we'll just briefly have the risk warnings left up here on the screen for you to read yourself. I'll leave them on screen for a number of seconds. It won't take you very long to read through, but it will certainly keep, keep our compliance department happy before we actually proceed with the actual webinar itself. So just make sure you have a, a good read of that before we actually continue on with the actual webinar itself. Now that we've gone through the actual web, gone through the risk, risk management, uh, risk warning slides, we can now actually focus on what has actually been going on in the in the financial markets. <clears throat> we saw a major bounce back in uh, European equities uh, this morning. Um, we had some obviously some major turbulence <clears throat> last week. Last week was the uh, in terms of weekly performance was the second worst weekly performance for both the, for both the Dow Jones as and the S and P 500. We saw major losses in Europe. We saw losses in Asia, but this morning we've seen a bounce back in European equities. Uh, over the weekend, we've had an, an announcement from a from a representative of the CIA in the United States, who stated they are not expecting imminent war with North Korea. Nonetheless, tensions are still very high. We just haven't progressed on, uh, thankfully, any 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 additional escalation to the standoff between North Korea and the United States. And what has that translated into is that we've seen a, a lot of bargain hunting, a lot of uh, bouncing back, and some sh and, and uh, some short hunting, short short uh, short covering rather, bargain hunting and short covering has led to a bounce back in indices in, in Europe this morning. Uh, what, what, what looking at in terms of the moves you could potentially see uh, for the week ahead, uh, taking a look here at our 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 update, our our, our um, weekly calendar for, uh, for the week commencing the 14th of August, which can be found on the, going to our, our, our going to our website under the news and analysis. Scroll down here under topic. Look at weekly outlook. Let me click on this weekly earnings calendar. We commence the 14th of August 2017. We talk about the major uh, announcements that we that, that are on the cards for the next few days, both in terms of corporate news and also in terms of economic data. Uh, so in terms of what to look out for, well, I'll, I'll talk about the, the numbers we had in China overnight in a moment. What to look out for during the week? Uh, on Tuesday we have uh, we have U.S. Uh, retail sales on Wednesday. We have a up update from the Federal Reserve. Uh, also on Wednesday, we have numbers out from Cisco Systems. On Thursday, we have numbers out from Walmart. Uh, and and uh, turning to the, the corporate calendar this week, to be honest, is very very quiet. Uh, looking at looking ahead to tomorrow, we got number we got second quarter numbers out from Home Depot. As I mentioned, Wednesday we have Cisco Systems. We also have an update second quarter numbers. From Target on Wednesday in the United States, uh, we have the clothing retailer from the U.S. The Gap um, reporting their second quarter numbers on Thursday, and on Friday we have Foot Locker and John Deere. So in terms of corporate stories, it isn't the most interesting to be perfectly honest. Honest, but if you are if you do have positions in those stock, it is obviously very much worth worth your while tuning in. Uh, now turning our attention to what's going on in terms of corporate in terms of economic indicators. Uh, here at CMC, we have a economic calendar built into our platform. It's under the Market Pulse tab, and it is the fourth option down, Market Calendar. I'll, let's talk about what, what to look ahead to first and foremost, and then afterwards a double back and talk about the numbers that we've had out today. So looking ahead to tomorrow, what we can expect on the economic calendar, uh, we've brought numbers out uh, from, from Germany uh, at 7 a.m., Half nine, we have uh, CPI numbers out of the UK. That's obviously going to be a big one to watch out for. As I mentioned a moment ago, retail sales from the United States out at lunchtime uh, on Tuesday. Uh, turning our attention to Wednesday in the UK, at half nine, we have unemployment numbers. We have Eurozone GDP numbers out at 10 a.m. 
on Wednesday. As always, at half three, we have the energy. We have the we have the the oil inventory figures coming out uh, at half three, which is obviously going to be very important and very focus, uh, very much uh, in focus if you're a trade if you're trading the oil markets. Uh, on on Thursday morning, the early hours of Thursday, we have trade figures coming out from Japan, unemployment numbers coming out of Australia, retail sa- sales from at half nine on Thursday morning from the UK, and we have CPI numbers coming out of the Eurozone on Thursday morning. And lastly, on the days, uh, looking ahead for the week, uh, Friday be one of the kind of more quieter days. We have uh, CPI CPI numbers coming out of Canada. Uh, in the morning time, we have PPI numbers coming out of Germany, and we have the University of, of Michigan consumer sentiment out of the United States. So turning our attention to what we saw overnight, uh, we, we saw some quite strong growth numbers out of J- Japan overnight uh, on a on a, it was a quarterly numbers on an annualized basis. So for the second quarter, the Japanese economy grew by four percent. That's well ahead of the forecast of two point five percent, and it's a considerable increase on the previous update of two point two percent. So despite the fact that we saw quite good numbers out of uh, growth numbers out of Japan, we did see the Nikkei trade lower for a combination of things, for a combination of reasons. Uh, partially because the Bank of Japan has a very aggressive stimulus policy in place and good growth numbers could then translate to the Bank of Japan possibly look to maybe altering or tapering in the size of their very aggressive bond buying scheme. But analysts and traders aren't really calling for that just yet. But it's a step in the right direction. It's a classic example of good news being bad news. Good news for the economy can mean bad news for the stock market. In that, whenever the whenever the stimulus package uh, shows signs that it's actually working, you will then see uh, central bankers look to alter and rein in their very loose monetary policy. Something which we'll talk about in regarding the eurozone uh, later in the webinar. Overnight uh, in China, uh, almost in, in a way, almost the opposite impact. Uh, in China, we saw retail sales come in lower than expected and decline on the on, on the um, on the last report. Same with industrial production and same with fixed asset investment. Uh, so what we saw in China was further evidence that the second largest economy in the world is cooling. But we did see shares in both Shanghai and Hong Kong perform well. This is the opposite effect, whereby you can have bad news equals good news in that a news that which isn't great for the economy. Uh, can actually lead to central bankers and and policymakers in in terms of fiscal policy, in terms of infrastructure spending, and projects actually increase speculation. We could see some uh, assistance, be it from the Beijing Beijing authorities or the actual central Chinese central bank itself. So this is the opposite impact, whereby we saw weaker than expected retail sales, industrial production, and fixed asset investment in China, but we actually saw the markets in in Hong Kong. And Shanghai trade higher on the back of it. Why? Because it, 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 we all know it, we all know that the Chinese government will not allow their economy to cool down considerably. They'll actually allow a gradual cool down. But should we see any signs of that it's cooling down considerably, that's when we could look to actually getting some sort of stimulus package, or else be it in the, in the form of um, be it in the form of an actual fiscal package, be it something like uh, infrastructure projects, or perhaps the loosening up credit lines to make credit more easily available but as i mentioned we did we did have a very uh, very positive start to the trading session here in europe and taking a look now at the FTSE 100 it's done quite well uh, in, in the morning so far if we take a look at it here on the, on the daily chart we can see today's move is we saw a major sell-off uh only on, on the on the friday just gone it tested the support at 72.95 uh, which coincides with the kind of late, late, late June, early July lows, but it managed to ha- hold on to those levels. But what is concerning, though, is that when you see the market bounce back, as you can see in this this this, this uh, positive candle here, but yet on the on the momentum side, we are still seeing that negative momentum has actually increased on the time period. So this sort of divergence could be a sign that that the move we're seeing higher, the positive move, the positive move that we're seeing today may not last. Now, it, when, it comes to, when it comes to looking at charts, price is the most important indicator, everything else becomes secondary. But this could be a clue that the, move, the upward move that, we, that, that uh, we've seen today is just a bounce back in the wider downward trend that the market is in. 
So any kind of potential moves higher we could see in the FTSE 100 could run into resistance at this level here, just shy of 7,400 of the one or day moving average, and then beyond that at 7,431, the 50 day moving average. But if you notice, it isn't as clear cut on the uh, the DAX and, or the CAC, but broadly speaking, we have seen a push, push lower uh, since the all time highs were created back in June. Should we see a move, should we take out this high here, this region, beyond 7,515 and 7,561, then we can be more confident that this, that the move, the negative move we've seen since June was only a correction in the wider, larger trend. But should we, should we continue to see the FTSE 100 south of 7,400, we could continue to actually push lower. And looking to the downside, bears you looking towards 7,295, this level here, and then beyond that, we'll be looking towards the 200 day moving average of 7,248. You'll see what it means now, whereby it becomes much more apparent that the, the downward trend is, is still in place uh, in the Jura market, in the, the DAX. So, as we can see here, after creating an all time high in June, it then goes on to create a newer low, new lower high, lower low lower high and then a lower low so this move that we're seeing here this push high we're, we're seeing today could this be just uh, a rally before the next the next move south bearing in mind it's a classic example of a downward trend lower lows and lower highs we've seen for about eight or ten weeks now uh, so we're currently trading at 12,143 on the Germany 30 but we could be looking at running into resistance in around this region here, the the, um, the August highs of 12,343. We may not even get that far. We may only get as far as 12,200 before we potentially take the next move lower. If we move north of 12,343, then we can get a bit more we get a bit more confident that this is just this downward trend we've seen since June is only more of a correction in the wider big picture. And should we see that, uh, the next level to watch out for beyond that will be the 100 day moving average at 12,450. But if you fail to take out these levels here, 12,200 and 12,343, we could be looking to get a retesting the 200 day moving average at um, 11,924. And then beyond that, we'll be looking back towards the 11,800 level. To be fair, the European, the U.S. equity markets have been in far better shape than the equity markets uh, on this side of the pond. And by looking at the Dow now, you can see exactly what, what I mean by it. So the Dow Jones had a stellar performance here, ratcheting up record high after record high. The market did start to, to, to give back a bit of ground, and, the, and, and we did see a large move lower on the back of the political uh, uh, uncertainty and the tensions between the United States and North Korea. But we have come off the lows here. We did finish uh, slightly, uh, we did finish slightly higher on Friday after the major sell-off uh, during the previous few days. So look here on the on, on the on the uh, US 30, the Dow Jones. We're currently trading uh, at 21,970. Should we get north uh, of 22,000, we we'll then be looking towards 20, 22,100, and then and then of course we we'll be looking towards 22,200. It is a time of heightened political uncertainty, but at the same time, we don't appear the tensions don't appear to be getting any higher. So it, it is possible that the, the pullback that we have seen here in the US 30 in the Dow Jones is just a bit of a shakeout before we actually before we resume the wider trend. But that being said, we must be, we must be very aware of the fact that, as you can see, while the market was pushing higher here. It was, uh, it was confirmed by the push higher here in positive momentum. Now we swung to negative momentum, and actually negative momentum is actually increasing, increasing at the same time the price is also increasing. And that's a classic example of a diversion. So this could be an indication that the push higher we're seeing in price isn't going to last very long. And should we turn, should the market turn over on itself, we would be looking back towards 21,800 and then 21,741, and 21,688. 
Taking a look now at what's going on with the S&P 500. Uh, the S&P 500 is similar, but not a, not as in a robust and kind of rude health as the actual Dow Jones is. So, not too dissimilar here. Uh, we saw a major sell-off uh, last Thursday, closed higher on Friday, fractionally, and then we're actually pushing higher again here uh, on Monday morning in the S&P 500 futures. It is worth pointing out, though, that we're still very much in ter negative uh, region in terms of the momentum. So you, you may want to be, be a bit skeptical uh, before before the uh, before before buying back into this. For the time being, we're trading north of the 50-day moving average. I was in around the uh, 2,448 region. We're currently we're currently trading at 2,455. It has acted in some respects as a bit of a not a bit of a support measure um, and and, and, and pre uh, up to the previous. Uh, to previous pullbacks, so you have seen some dips below it. So, for all, so it is possible that this this large sell off here is just a dip below it, and we're not going to get a um, we're not going to have support from this price here of, uh, in around 2450. Should we take out this at this level here, 2460, then we can become more confident that the, that the sell off you saw and uh, during last week was only just a kind of a, a bit of a shakedown, a bit of a correction, what we saw in the wider upper trend. And then, of course, if you can continue on to press to 2,470, then we become more confident again. And then traders and buyers will start looking towards the all-time high of just shy of 2,490. And then, of course, beyond that, 2,500 would be the big number to watch out for. But should we see uh, the market dip back below the 50-day moving average, we then be looking at this price here, uh, the, the Friday low of 2,432. And then below that, we'll be looking back towards 2,418. Let's have a quick look at the NASDAQ 100. As you can see, it uh, probably has more in common in terms of price action with the S&P 500 than it does with the Dow Jones. So this, this, this major sell-off here traded below the 50-day moving average bounce traded north of it again we managed to get a steady steady in the ship and actually look 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 appear to be testing uh, the highs of last week so we're currently trading 5866 on the Nasdaq 100 the 50 day moving average at basically 5800 is providing support so while we remain north of that that's obviously going to that's obviously going to be a positive indicator Looking towards the upside, we're going to be looking towards 5,897, and then beyond that, we'll then be looking towards this high here uh, in August at 5,973, and then beyond that, we're looking towards 6,000. Uh, to the south side, should we move back below the 50-day moving average, we're going to be looking towards Friday's low is going to be in the region of 5,760, and then south of that again. We'll be looking at the 100 day moving average, which comes into play just shy of 5,700. As we can see here, on the sell off that we witnessed in late June, early July didn't even get as low as the 100 day moving average. So that's that's an indication that it, it has, has, even in advance, acted as a, as a level of support. So if we push lower, we could see some fresh buying in or around the 100 day moving average. I will point out it is a bit concerning though that we, we are seeing. Uh, the negative moment to be to be uh, albeit declined slightly since Friday, still very much in negative territory. As you, what I, what I mentioned a moment ago about divergence, what you need to be wary is if the if the market is moving in a certain direction, and in this case going on to create all time highs, you would like it to be also reflected in the momentum, the rate of change. As you can see here, the market was creating with pushing on to new all time highs. But as you can see, the momentum, the rate of change ran out and then we saw a decline in momentum only, only to have the market actually turn over on itself. So just be aware that if you're buying into a market while momentum is in negative territory, it, it could be a sign that the current positive run may not last very long. Uh, turning our attention now to gold, which had a good week last week, but can't surprise is not having the best of times today given that it's very much a risk on attitude uh, traders are taking so 
On last week, when we saw a large decline in global equities, the price of price, we saw a push higher in the price of gold. And now this morning that we're seeing uh, the reversal of that position, we're seeing traders take on more risk, buying into global buying into global equities, and the flip side, cashing out of your classic safe haven assets such as gold. It is a bit concerning that gold didn't uh, take out something to slightly worried about that at the high on Friday was 1292 gold didn't quite get to the high of uh, the June high the 2017 high as well of 1296 and we have managed to press a bit lower on that but for the time being we're holding firm at the support at 1280 should you remain north of 1280 the outlook will, will still look positive considering that gold has broadly been trading Somewhere in around the kind of low 1200s to high 1200s, uh, basically throughout throughout the last number of months. So we've seen a lot of kind of a range range bound action for gold. It's shied away from breaking through 1200, but it's certainly held firm well above the 1200. Uh, it's certainly held firm up north of 1200. So this could be just a continuation of the range bound move that we've seen in gold. Last Friday's move in gold was also helped by the fact that the United States uh, had an increase in inflation both on a month-on-month -month basis and on a year-on-year -year basis but both actually failed to actually meet expectations so on one hand it's, it's it's encouraging to see that demand is picking up in the form of ever so slightly higher inflation from the United States but also on the, on the flip side because markets have priced in a larger increase in gold we did see that additional jolt higher um, the Fed watch which is a tool belonging to the Chicago Mercantile Exchange the CME uh, was, is pricing in a 38% chance of a rate hike from the Federal Reserve in December. And obviously, there's quite an inverse relationship between the perception of higher rates from the Federal Reserve and the price of gold. Uh, looking to the downside, should gold trade south of 1280, we were looking back towards the support in around the region of around 1270, 1265. Turning, sticking with the commodities theme and Turning our attention now to the oil market, um, over the, we heard from the International Energy Agency who stated that in July, OPEC's compliance with their agreed production freeze, production cut, dropped to 75%, to its lowest rate since January. So in an era whereby in at the end of May, we heard that, that OPEC members and a number of non-OPEC member, members were going to have a coordinated production cut in a bid to actually ramp up the price. But we did see some countries actually increase their oil production. And traders then began to kind of lose a bit of faith in OPEC. Uh, they started to believe that OPEC members and some non-OPEC members were more in it for themselves rather than the wider organization. So that this move here that we saw in late, late May, this push higher, was actually the announcement that the OPEC, that the, the production cut is actually going to be increased and extend, sorry, this is going to be extended rather. Uh, it was going to be extended until the end of March 2018. And what do we see? We saw a large sell-off in the price of oil in the back of it. Since then, we've had we've had a number of a uh, number of uh, announcements out of oil-producing countries stating that they're not going to fall in line and they're going to have higher adhere adhere proper adherence to the actual agreement. Uh, but for the, for the time being, equity tr um, traders in the oil market still seem to be a bit unconvinced. And when I was talking about momentum, as we can see here, the price of oil on um, Brent crude was pushing higher, but it really kind of failed to make considerable ground north of $53 a barrel. And on the flip side, we can see here that momentum is pushing higher, but then as you can see, the momentum is dwindling, dwindling, dwindling. And then what do we see here? It did, if it surged higher, um, but it still has managed to fall back. So for the time being, while it remains just north of the 30-day moving average, which it currently is basically resting on at $51.80, the outlook is still going to be positive, but provided it hangs north of the 30-day moving average. And to the upside, buyers will be looking towards $53.83, the August high, and then the May high of $54.57, rather, and then beyond that, the April high of $56.53. You... If the market was pushing higher, you would like to see a turnaround in momentum and momentum actually increase and gather with pace. Uh, should we see oil fall back below the $50, sorry, I apologize, the opportunity moving average uh, at $51.80, then we could we get a bit more nervous. And that's that's when you could see the oil price 
pushing back down towards fifty dollars a barrel or even down back towards forty eight dollars and ninety two cents it's a very similar chart uh, looking at WTI but the prices are obviously going to be different similar move at, at the moment at the last couple of trading sessions the price of WTI has actually been trapped in between the two day moving average at $49.16 to the upside and to the downside the 100 day moving average at $47.84 so Traders are going to be looking for a breakout in, in either direction. That that's going to be the indication. If we go if we if we go north, we then be looking towards fifty dollars a barrel, and then beyond that, fifty one sixty six and fifty three fifty six. Uh, to the south side, if we go if you go below the one day moving average, we then be looking towards back towards the fifty day moving average at forty six dollars and thirty five cents, and then down towards the actual forty five dollar mark itself. Taking a look now at a couple of big currency pairs. Like I mentioned, um, any markets, I'll be covering a few of the major currency pairs in the next few minutes. And any 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 markets uh, which I haven't covered, uh, please feel free to give a shout out and just put a message in the message box and I'll get on to uh, covering those. So after a tremendous run throughout 2017, uh, we have seen the euro dollar push higher, push on to uh, fresh multi-year highs versus the US dollar um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar talking about how good news can be good, good news um, in the economy can translate to an alteration uh, of the central bank policy the weak euro for the last number of years has really helped the eurozone economy turn around and the better the better economic indicators we're seeing out of the eurozone which broadly speaking we have been seeing decent uh, economic indicators from the region uh, the more convinced traders will be, are, will be that Mario Draghi, the president of the European Central Bank, will in the next few weeks or months start potentially talking about uh, tr trimming or tapering or reducing the size of the 60 billion uh, euros a month bond buying scheme that the ECB had in place. Mr. Draghi is due to speak at the um, Jackson Hole Symposium later this month, at, at the very end of, the, of this month. And bearing in mind, it was at Jackson Hole Symposium three years ago when he laid the, the groundwork for the European Central Bank actually going down the route of having a major um, quantitative st uh, stimulus package, quantitative easing program. And now three years on, there's talk of him actually laying the groundwork for him um, having having a having a dis potential discussion about reducing the size of it and that's precisely why we've seen the euro push higher and, and push higher also on the flip side it is against the us dollar so political uncertainty in, in donald trump's administration hasn't really helped uh mr trump hasn't been uh, able to bring about welfare reform which which he pledged to bring in and that in turn has got investors and uh, traders wondering what other if he's having this, this difficulty um reforming the healthcare uh, system in the United States. How is he going to bring in banking reform? How is he going to bring in tax reform? How is he going to bring in all the infrastructure projects which were planned, which is the so-called Trump trade? So we have seen a correction out of a pullback in the euro versus the, the US dollar, but now we're, we're currently trading uh, just sub 118 on the euro versus the dollar. If you get back north um, of 118 and 118.30, we can then become more confident. Uh, that the the market is going to continue continue to press on the new multi-year high. So what I would like to see is I want to see it get get beyond this level here, one eighteen thirty, and then we be, then we can become more confident that we're heading towards one nineteen ten, and then on to the and then on towards the direction of one twenty itself. Once again, it is a bit concerning though that we have seen a bit of an we have seen a push higher in the, the euro versus dollar in the last couple of sessions. All the, all the while, though, that, that sentiment or momentum, rather, is negative. So that is something to, uh, to watch out for. This move higher, this may, may not last very long if they could have the pointing, if we're seeing negative momentum. It could be an early sign that the push I was seeing in the last couple of days may not last very long. I'm aware of the time now. Uh, we'll be finishing up in the next few minutes. Uh, just gone quarter to one, and it's a half in our webinar, so we'll be finishing now in a few minutes. 
the pound has had a much worse time versus the US dollar than the actual, than the actual the single currency has. But it does appear to be getting support here. This 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 large red candle here is, is from Thursday the third of August when the Bank of England had, had a fairly dovish update. So I've seen a fairly consistent selling of the pound versus the US dollar. Uh, moment, negative momentum is increasing to, is is continuing to increase. So we could see a further push lower in the pound versus the dollar. Levels to watch out for to the downside is going to be the 50-day moving average at 129.35. If you go south of that, we'll be looking towards the 100-day moving average at 128.54 and then back towards 128, the figure. If you do see money come back into the pound, any kind of rallies could encounter resistance at 130.59 and 131.64. But for the time being, between the price moving lower, negative momentum is on the rise, I think then we could see further losses the pound uh, in the next few sessions looking at euro versus the british pound euro sterling the euro continue to make uh, very good gains versus the british pound uh, it's currently trading at uh, just north of 90, 90 pence it's currently trading at 90 uh, 90 94 levels to watch out to the off, off Levels you're watching out for to the upside because it's in quite a clear and an obvious upward trend uh, heading towards 91.41 and then beyond that towards 92. Any moves lower uh, that we see in the euro sterling looking back towards this area here of the actual of um, this price action here of 90, 90, sorry, 90.51 and then below that 90, 90 pence itself and then sub that again we'd be looking towards 88.80. I think quite a clear and concise bullish trend uh, for the for the for the euro versus the British pound. Uh, turning our attention now to the US dollar versus Japanese yen, it's had a considerable uh, sell-off uh, in recent weeks and months. It's been a quite an quite an obvious uh, uh, push lower in terms of price action. We, what, we've, what we've seen here since uh, since for well actually over a month now, it's been a fairly consistent decline. We have seen a large turnaround today, so we're currently, after quite a considerable sell-off over the last four weeks, we have pushed higher on the dollar yen. Should you remain north of the uh, the, the support here, of the support here at 109.56, uh, then we can we could potentially see a move back up towards 110.18 and 110.64. But the the trend is very much to the downside. The low here in August managed to take off the low in June. So we could be heading, we could look towards a return back towards 108.73, which is the August low, and if we take that out, we'd be looking towards 108.13. Uh, have a look at the Australian dollar versus the Japanese yen. I certainly will. Currencies. The Australian dollar versus the Japanese yen. So the first thing I would just, I would just comment on this is that it's in a fairly this uh, time frame here. After quite a considerable sell-off, uh, the Aussie versus the Japanese yen. But by frankly, for the last number of years, we are seeing a, a bounce back in it. Whether this is just this this positive move here. Is just a correction of the wider move, which is considerable. The Australian dollar has obviously lost considerable ground in the last number of years, given the slowdown in their economy because of the slowdown in the mining sector. And now we have been seeing a broad push higher uh, from about mid 2016. So, looking at this chart here on this time scale, I would say it's in a fairly clear and obvious upward trend. But getting get a closer to what we've seen more recently, we've seen a fairly aggressive sell off in the Aussie versus the yen. Partially because the uncertainty recently uh, has, has prompted traders to buy the Japanese yen. It's, it's one of the kind of classic safe haven currencies. But notice how here, what we're seeing here is what I'm talking to you about momentum. How as the, the Aussie yen is pushing higher, we can see momentum push higher, but kind of plateau a bit. And then after we saw the plateau, we saw the swing to negative momentum. And now, and now we can see a, a, quite an aggressive sell-off here in the Aussie yen and that's that mirrored 
by a large increase in the negative momentum. If the momentum was to kind of taper off a bit, we could see a resumption of the wider trend, but it, it's but at the same time, it, 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 the, the recent sell-off really can't be ignored. I would be a bit looking at this if it continues to hold above the 50-day moving average at this in this in this price here in around 86, 86, 20. We can then become more confident in a, in, in a move higher and resumption of the kind of wider positive trend that we've seen. Uh, well, going back quite some time uh, from from around from kind of September, October last year. We did manage to create new highs for 2017, which is which is something, um, which is something to um, to take to take note of. But we seem to be at a level here whereby it's, the market seems does seem a bit a bit uncertain. Um, we, we could potentially, if, if what we could see here is a scenario whereby some traders might kind of sit in the sideline and just wait until we actually get a, a move in either direction. Whether we, if we if we break back below the 50-day moving average, we could we could look for a, a testing of the 200-day moving average, which comes to play at 85.01. Uh, but then again, if we take off say 87 and we're considerably above the 50-day moving average, we can then be more confident that this is that, that, that this move here was just a sell-off in the kind of wider trend we've seen for the last seven or eight months. And then beyond that, we'd be looking towards 88 and 89, and then on, on towards 90 because. We already created a fresh 2017 high only last month, so if the, if the trend is in, is, is in place, it'll, it'll up, up push trends in place. Traders, of course, will then be looking toward to create new highs for 2017, which, which, which would point us in the 90 direction. Should we, on the other hand, move south to the 50 moving average, we then be looking back towards the 200 day moving average, and we haven't really spent a whole lot of time south of the 200 day moving average. And then I guess we'll be looking towards support in around the kind of 84 region and then 83 region uh, south of the 200 moving average. I was told the sound isn't very clear. Um, any, has anybody else experienced uh, poor sound? I'll turn my attention now to the Aussie versus the US dollar. This now will be the uh, sound all good, excellent. This now will be the uh, the last market that we're taking a look at because we've gone a few minutes over time, just about seven minutes over time. Not too dissimilar to, to, what, we, to what we've witnessed on the Australian dollar versus the Japanese yen. The Aussie uh, versus the US dollar has been pushing pushing in a broad upward trend basically throughout, throughout 2017, although we have seen an aggressive sell-off in the last number of weeks. Not as aggressive as you witnessed against the Japanese yen, but aggressive nonetheless. As you can see here, the market was pushing higher. All at the same time, momentum was edging lower. And then, of course, what did we see? We saw the price actually pull back a few hundred pips. So when I was talking to you earlier, earlier one of the indicators that I like to look, about, look at is momentum. And if, price, if the price is moving higher and momentum is moving higher, great. If the price is moving lower and momentum is moving lower, then great. When the two diverge, that's when you've got to be a bit cautious. The price is the one to follow, but just be aware if, if the momentum is moving in the opposite direction, the move we're seeing in the market may not last. And this is the classic example of what we're seeing here. While we hold above this level here uh, at 78.34, the outlook for the, for, the, for the Australian dollar is, going, is still going to be positive. And we're looking back up towards 80, and then we look back up towards the July high of 80.65. If you break below this this level here, the August low of 78.34, we're then looking back towards 77.86, and then after that again, we, you know, we, we could see some buying in this this area here, which coincides with the 50-day moving average of 77.41. Right, we'll just end the, this before we kind of end the webinar now. I just wanted to remind you, as always. Um, Myself and my colleagues here at CMC Markets. We also update. Uh, I've already showed you the. Uh, or I shall showed you the week ahead article. That's where all our news articles go. Some of our articles also get posted on Insight, which I've opened here on my platform. Where to find Insight? Market Pulse. Third, second option down. You click on Insight. Uh, some of the articles we get posted uh, only go on Insight. Other ones only get posted on the news site. Uh, some get posted on both. In relation to what we, uh, in relation to more kind of a, a short and snappy version, um, looking uh, at what we think of certain charts, we get chart forum which I've opened here on the right, uh, and it is the third option down. So 
it's just a quick I'll have a quick chart and a couple of a couple hundred characters or 250 characters discussing what we think that the price action could do so I'll keep keep an eye on that as well um, obviously um, you've found this webinar uh, so feel free to tune into other webinars uh, this week we on um, Wednesday uh, Wednesday night uh, at half 7 p.m. Uh, for the summertime 1930 we have the next generation foreign exchange webinar looking beyond that uh, as you do every Monday we'll have, uh, I'll be back on uh, next next Monday for the webinar then and then of course we have a webinar on the 23rd uh, of August at 19.30 British summer time and that is covering uh, the Global Market Report. So feel free to sign up for other webinars as well. Uh, I'd like to thank you for my time. I've been Dave Madden from CMC Markets. Uh, have a good week and good luck.